Thank you, everybody, for gracing us. Let's begin with a few kapitlach of Tehillim, please, for our brothers and sisters in the Holy Land, for all of the hostages who are still in captivity, for all of our soldiers, all of our brave soldiers, for all of the wounded, and for all of the families of the slain, and for all of our brothers and sisters in Israel and the world over. There's Tehillims on the Bima, if you want a Tehillim, in the back of the Siddur on the, on, on the Bima. Let's say together, Kapitel uh, Pei pe Gimel. Pei Gimel is 83. Uh, it starts off Shir, Shir Mizmar. Okay, Tehillim Pei Gimel. Shir Mizmar La'asaf Elohim Al Domilach. Al techerash val tishkoit el, kihine oivecha ye ma yu numus hanecha nasurosh, al amcha yari musoid, vis yatso al tsfunecha. Amru lechu venachide mi goivala yzacher shem israel oid, kinoya tsu lev yachdov, alecha bris yich roisu. A le edem vishme elim, maya vahagrim, gval va amain va amalek, pleshes im yoishvetzer. Gam Ashur Nilva Imam Hoyuzraya Livne Eloit Sela Aselahem Kemidion Kisisra Chiyavin Benachal Kishain Nishmedu Vein Dyer Hoyu Doy Menla Doma Shisema Nidive Moi Kaurev Vichizeev Uchezeva Huchetzalmuna Kol Nesiche Moi Asher Amru Nir Shalan Oes Nois Alehim Eloi hai, she say moi chagalgal, ke kash lifne ruach, ke eishti va yoar, u chulehova talayit hodim, kain tir de fame beside echa, u visufos chasevalim, ma leif neim kolein vivakshu shimcha de noi, ye voishu vibalu ade ad viachbudu vie vedu, viedu kiato shimcha ade noi levadecha, elyoin al kolha oretz. Now we'll say Tehillim, Kuf, Chaf, Aleph, and Kuf, Chaf, Beis. That's 121 and 122. Kuf, Chaf, Aleph, and Kuf, Chaf, Beis. Shir la malois, Esa eina yela hori, me ayin yava yezri, Ezri me imadinoi, oise shemayim varet, Al yitain la moitraglacha, Al yonum shemrecha, Hine lo yonum velo yishon, Shaymer Yisrael, Adinoy Shemrecha, Adinoy Tzilchal, Yadi Minecha, Yoymam Hashem Eshloya Keka, Vyerech Baloyla, Adinoy Yishmar Chamikora, Yishmar Es Nafshecha, Adinoy Yishmar Tzeischa, Uvayecha, Meyata Viyad Olam, and the next one. Shir HaMalois Ledovit, Samachti Baimrim Libeis Adinoy Nelech, Oim Dois Hoyur Agleinu Bisharai Echirushaloyim, Yerushalayim abnuya kirsha chubra lo yachdav, shasham alu shvatim shifta ya edus li Yisrael la haydus la shem adinai, kisham ayashvu chis ois le mishpat, kis ois le veiz david, shalu shlaim Yerushalayim yishlayu oyavayich, yihi shalim bechelech shalva barman oisayich, laman achai vedeya adabrana shalom bach, laman beis adinai aleheinu, avaksha, toiv lach. Let's do one more, which is kuf. Lamed Vav, Kuf Lamed Zion, I'm sorry, Kuf Lamed Zion, 137. Al Nara is Bavel, Kuf Lamed Zion. Al Nara is Bavel, Shom Yoshavnu, Gambachinu, Bezachrenu, Esiyon, Al Aravim, Besoicha, Talinu, Kinoiru Yisenu, Kishom Sheilenu, Shoivenu, Divnei Shir, Vesoilaleinu, Simcha, Shiru Lanu, Mishir Tziyon, Echna Shir Es Shir Adinai, Al Admas Nechar, Im ashkache chirushalayim tishkachimini tidbak l'shoni l'chikim loy eskerechim loy ala sirushalayim al rosh simchasi schayr adinay levnei edayim esyoyim yirushalayim ha'aymrim aru aru adai esayid ba baz bavel hashduda ashrei shei shalom lach es gmulech shagamalt lano ashrei shei yoyches v'nipetz eselalayich el hasala. We always do the last capital of Tehillim, which is kufnun. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah, el bekotre, hallelujah, birkia uzoi, hallelujah, begvuroi sof, hallelujah, kerev gudloi, hallelujah, beseka shoifer, hallelujah, benevel vechiner, hallelujah, besoifum machar, hallelujah, beminim vogov, hallelujah, betzotzele shama, hallelujah, betzotzele srua, koil anashama, ta hallelujah, hallelujah. Up, oh, Randy is here. Gavaldik. Wow, okay, beautiful. Oh. Randy, thank you for making the effort and coming. I want to welcome Randy Hershkowitz. Who always adds so much light to our class. Yes. I know parking is not easy for anybody in this area, <laughs> but her effort is really uh, very profound. So thank you for coming and gracing us with your presence, and thank you everybody for coming and gracing us with your presence. And some of you traveled from far away, so welcome and thank you. And welcome to everybody who's uh, watching online as well. <clears throat> Next week is, of course, Hanukkah. Next week, there will not be a class on Tuesday. We will resume Be'ezer Hashem the following week. So please share with your friends or family who may attend that next Tuesday we are not on. <clears throat> Today's class is dedicated in honor of the upcoming wedding of Avigail Hammer to Shalom Rudinsky, dedicated by her grandparents, Esther and Nachman Goodman. Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov, Abinyan Adeyad, an amazing, blessed, happy, joyous life. Larichis Yomim Vishanim Tovis, Mazel Tov to the Kala, to the Chasun, to Avigail, to Shalom, and the whole family. Thank you. Today's class is also dedicated by Jonathan Jarisho in honor of the 24th yard site of his son and constant inspiration, Noyach Rafal, whose yard site is on the 21st day of Kislev. Also in honor of the yard site of his parents, the ninth yard site of his father, Shmuel Tzvi Ben Benyamin, today on the 22nd day of Kislev, and in memory and in loving tribute to the first yard site of his mother, Chaya Bas Avraham Isaac. Thank you very, very much. And to Hei Nishmasam Tzura B'Tzur HaChaya, may your son and your parents remain an eternal source of blessing and light and inspiration to you, the entire family, and all of the Jewish people. Amen. Someone sent me a very beautiful clip. A man, Rabbi Landau, shares a story that he heard or saw from a journalist in Israel. His name is Yitzchak Horowitz. And Yitzchak Horowitz joined one of the battalions, one of the platoons of Israeli soldiers fighting in Gaza. And uh, this particular platoon, one day they made a minion for Shachris. In the morning there was a lull in their fighting and they uh, gathered together in a safe place to Davin Shachris. It was a day when you read the Torah, and they had a Sefer Torah, so they read the Torah. At the end, one of the commanders said he wants to make the blessing of Hagoimel. Now, <laughs> obviously, if you're in Gaza, you could probably, and you're alive, you could probably make Hagoimel every moment, but he wanted to make a special blessing of Hagoimel and express gratitude. And he did. And after davening, he tells Yitzchak Horowitz, the journalists, he says, this is a dangerous zone and we have suffered many casualties here. But you won't imagine also how many incredible miracles we're observing every day. And he says, the one I made a blessing for was something that just happened. And as he said, it takes the cake in Hebrew, however you say it. Mm -hmm. 
And he told him the following story, which Yitzchak Karowitz heard from the man, from this commander. He said he was with his uh, platoon in a, uh, in a section of Gaza, a camp, it's called Fushati. Fushati. And uh, the soldiers have conquered a particular area, which seemed very calm at the moment. So they sat down to eat lunch. One of the soldiers took out what they usually serve as meals for soldiers in battle, which is tuna, cans of tuna. And he took out his tuna can and opened it up in order to eat some tuna. For those who are familiar with uh, the f- food arrangements in the Tzahal, as I've heard, the cans of tuna are not that delicious. They're not that tasty. So one of the old traditions or rituals that many soldiers do is they open the can of tuna, <laughs> they strike a match, <laughs> and they light the oil in the tuna. And of course, after three minutes, they have smoked tuna, almost as good as mom's and grandmom's tuna. So this soldier, out of habit, he didn't even think twice, as he took out his tuna, he struck the match, and he lit the oil in the tuna can, And it caught on fire to be able to eat tuna with a little bit of a tam, just a little bit of a taste and flavor, even in Gaza. As it starts burning, the soldier sitting near him goes into a panic and says, Atamir Shuga, are you crazy? There's live ammunition here. You know what's happening here. This can all explode from this fire. And without hesitating for a second, the soldier takes the entire tuna can and with all of his might and power throws it as far as he can, just to get the danger out in a split second. And a moment later, they all hear a huge explosion. And they're terrified because that means the enemy is right here. And they all get into position and start shooting at the target from which this explosion came from. And they're shooting and shooting and shooting. And then after a few minutes, there's silence. There's like a lull, like a, a pause in the shooting, and suddenly they see a bunch of Hamas terrorists emerging from a tunnel with white flags, surrendering. What happened? This can of tuna landed in the opening of a tunnel. Today we know that this is what they know about. They know about 800 tunnels that were built by Hamas. Now understand, these are billions of dollars that were sent into Gaza by the international community, right, who were all duped (laughs) in basically funding terror tunnels. They know about 800. There may be double, who knows what there is, but that's where they built an infrastructure of terror. So this can of tuna went into the tunnel. There were a bunch of Hamas terrorists waiting there to come out and murder the entire platoon of soldiers. They were waiting in the tunnel for them, waiting to come out and kill all the soldiers while they're eating lunch. As this tuna can went there with the fire, they had live ammunition. It exploded. The Hamasniks felt and thought for sure the Israeli soldiers are coming down and none of them are going to survive. So thus they decided the best thing would be to come out with their white flags and surrender. So this is, he said, why he made Hagoimel that morning of the reading of the Torah. Now, obviously, the soldier, these are types of events. And Yitzchak Harawit said he heard it from the the person who was there. He heard it from the person who observed it, who was part of that group. He was the commander, actually, of that platoon. This is something the soldier couldn't plan, he couldn't anticipate, he couldn't prepare for. He lit it on fire, his friend screamed at him, he threw it, and they were all saved. I share it because, you know, in all the, the pain and tragedies and atrocities that the Jewish people experienced since Simchas Torah, and it's already Simchas Torah was the end of Tishrei, so you're dealing over here with uh, almost two months, Hanukkah, Erev Hanukkah will be two months, and uh, now is two months from that day, from Simchas Torah Shemini Atzeres. Uh, it's also very comforting and important to also see 
the unity and the resolve and the strength and the miracles that the Jewish people are experiencing. And maybe one of the biggest miracles is not just the heavenly miracles, but also the human miracles, meaning the miracle of the Jewish renaissance, of, of, of the Jewish love, of the Jewish power, the miracle that comes from within. I guess it's a very uh, important prelude to our discussion today. If you didn't get a source sheet, there's one on the Bima. And Parshas Vayeshev, we're going to discuss today both Parshas Vayeshev and then Hanukkah. Parshas Vayeshev, of course, is the story of Yosef. And we know from Bereshis all the way through Vayishlach is the story first of Adam and his descendants, Noach and his descendants, Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Our three patriarchs and the matriarchs are Rivka, Rachaleya, Bila, Zilpa. And then comes Parshas Vayeshev, and here the focus shifts from Yaakov Avinu to his son Yosef, and Yosef will, remain the main, Yosef will remain the main protagonist, the main character of Vayeshev, Miketz, Vayigash, Vayechi, the last four portions, the second half of Sefer Bereshis. His story, his journey, his trials, his tribulations, all the way to his unexpected rise to become the prime minister of the superpower of the time and saving the region and the fertile crescent and his own family from a devastating famine. Yosef, everybody remembers the story, was 17 years old when his brothers who loathed him took him and threw him into a cistern, a pit, and from there he was sold into slavery. A man named Paitifar, who was a minister working in Paray's government, purchased him as a slave. Yosef works as a slave in Paitifar's home. And he's extremely successful to the point that the Torah calls him an Ish Matzliach. Ish Matzliach, the first one who gets that definition. Ish Matzliach, a successful person, a person filled with Hatzlacha. He rises to the top despite his difficult circumstances. He essentially doesn't own himself. He's a slave and according to the protocol, there was no way for him to be liberated and he would have remained there for life. He experiences then a second crisis when Potiphar's wife accuses him of promiscuous uh, behavior and trying to uh, do and behave in a very promiscuous way towards her, violate her, and he's thrown into prison. Here too, he rises to the top, and despite being a prisoner, and a prisoner for a very long time, again, we encounter him as a very successful human being to the point that just like Potiphar in his home, appointed him to run the entire show and everybody was working under him in the prison the same thing happened he was appointed by the prison warden to be able to run the entire experience to run the show and everybody was under his command thank you thank you but i want to point out and here again we're going to focus on what would seem like one word one word or actually the absence of a word and that absence of one word contains within it a world of experience, of perspective, really of, of life-changing lesson. So if you take a look in your first source, it's Bereshis Perik Lamites. Genesis chapter 39, verse 1, begins the story of young Yosef, 17-year-old Joseph, arriving in Egypt as a slave. The Torah describes it, Yosef hurad mitzrayma. Yosef was brought down. Obviously, he didn't go down himself. Hurad means he was brought down by force to Egypt, and he's bought by a man named Petifar who works for Pari, who's an Egyptian. He buys him from the hands of the Ishmaelites who brought him down to Egypt. The second verse says, and I quote, Vayihi adenoi es Yosef, Vayihi ish matzliach, Vayihi beves adoyna vamitzri. Hashem was with Yosef to the point that he would became an ish matzliach, a successful person, as he is in the home of his master, the Egyptian man, Petifer. And the Torah continues, the third verse, His master sees that Hashem is with him. For all he does, whatever he does, everything he does, Hashem is creating success through his hand. 
Yosef's hand, just whatever he touches, turns into gold, as they say. There's just his hand is a channel for so much success. His master sees it. So what does he do? Yosef He likes this kid. Yosef finds grace in his eyes, and he appoints him on his home. verse for everything that he has, he gives over to him. In other words, he confers upon him the responsibility and the privilege of his entire estate, of everything that belongs to him. Yosef is the one who becomes the CEO over Potiphar's estate. And the Torah continues how this man becomes blessed, his house is blessed, and everything in the house is blessed. And in the fifth, sixth passage, by Yosef, Kola Shaloi Biyad Yosef. He lets everything, he lets go of everything and just gives it all to Yosef. He doesn't even know anything that's happening. All he cares is about the bread that he's going to eat, which Rashi says is a euphemism for his marriage. And the Torah finishes this part of the story by he Yosef you face Sayyav you face Mara, and Yosef was beautiful and handsome and gorgeous. <clears throat> the next scene is where Potiphar's wife takes a liking to Yosef. She nudges him and pleads with him that he be with her physically. Yosef refuses by On one fateful day, nobody is home. She tries to truly get him to do what he refused to do. And at this point, she fetches, she seizes him by his garment. Yosef runs away, his garment tears. She uses that evidence as a proof that he was the one who tried to violate her and her husband throws Yosef into prison. What happens now in prison? Almost a similar description to what happened in the house of Petifar, we now read in prison. Literally, almost verbatim. As you could see, Perik Lamates Pasuk Chaf Aleph, it's the second paragraph, there's already verse 21. Vayihi Hashem es Yosef. Exactly the same words which we learned earlier in Pasuk Beis. This is Pasuk Chaf Aleph, verse 2, verse 21. It says, Vayihi Hashem es Yosef. Here it says, Vayihi Hashem. Hashem was with Yosef. Vayihi Telav Chesed. Vayihi Telchinoi Be'enei Sar Be'es Asoya. The Sar, the warden, the one who was in charge of the prison, found grace in Yosef. Yosef found chain, grace in his eyes. There was something very gracious and beautiful about him. So what happens? This man takes Yosef and appoints him as the CEO of the prison. He's still a prisoner, but he's the one who is running the show. And Pasuk Chav Gimel says, Ein sar beis ha-soyer roya es kol mu'uma biyadoi v'asher adinoi itoi v'asher hu oisa adinoi matzliach. To the point, just like Petifar, let Yosef do everything and he didn't even want to know. You know, when you trust somebody blindly, it's like, it's good to go. Don't let me, don't bother me, don't tell me anything, just do it. I can only ruin it, so you just do it. The same description, the warden of the prison doesn't see anything that's happening. Why? Because Hashem is with Yosef and whatever Yosef does, Hashem atzliach. Now take a look at a few, at one little difference, one word changed. The words, Vasheru Oisa Hashem Atzliach, we already had before also in the house of Petifer. But there one word was added. You see which word was added over there? Take a look in Pasek Gimel, you see? V'choyla Hasheru Oisa, yeah, Hashem Atzliach B'yadoi. Whatever he does, Hashem brought success in his hand. Here, in prison, Pasek of Gimel, Vasheru Oisa Hashem Matzliach. Whatever he does, Hashem is matzliach. Doesn't say biyadah. Say, what's the difference? <laughs> his hand, not his hand. Was it? But it's interesting. The first time the Torah says it was in his hand. The second time, whatever he does, Hashem made it up matzlacha. Why does the Torah choose the second time to delete the word biyadah? That's what difference number one. Difference number two. The first time he's described, vayhi Hashem es Yosef, vayhi ish matzliach. He is a matzliach the command. That doesn't say the second time. The second time it says, But his description to describe the person, only the first time. Another interesting thing, the first time it says, Whatever he does, Hashem brought Atzlach in his hand. In prison it just says, Not everything he does, what he does. It means whatever he does, but it doesn't say everything he does. And yet, over here, it doesn't say the word biyada. 
So it looks like very small differences. I mean, the point is the same. He was extremely successful. He was gracious. People loved him. They believed in him. They trusted him. They just felt he's, uh, he's a successful man. He's tichtik, he's geshikt, whatever words they used in Egyptian about him. And uh, they trusted him and they delegated everything to him, despite the difficult circumstances. But we know in Torah, every word is precise and meticulous. As we will see, this single change of biyadeh, not biyadeh, contains within it a very profound intimation of Yosef's evolution. And in order to appreciate this, it's important to focus for a few moments on the story of Yosef himself, not what happened to him, but what happened inside of him. As you know, life consists of two parts. There's what happens to me, what happens with me, what happens with you, what happens to you, and then there is at that moment, what happens, not to me, but what happens in me, inside of me. Those are two different stories. <laughs> the first story is a story that people can see. It's on the outside. Some of those facts are just facts of life. A person goes here, a person goes here. This occurs, that occurs. The second story is an inner story. It's the story of the human response, human reaction, the human evolution and the human growth and development within the narrative and within the circumstances of every person's life. The facts are described in Chumash. What happens to Yosef inside, as always in Chumash, that's hinted to. In other words, the facts are the facts. His brothers didn't like him. It says, he, as we'll see in a moment, he, brought, uh, he, told, he told his father negative things about them. He told them about their dreams. He, they, they, they loathed him. They threw him into a pit. They sold him. He becomes a slave, and then he becomes a prisoner. Those are all the facts. What happened inside of Yosef? For this, you always have to read between the lines because those are the inner emotions. The third is a blueprint of life. That which you could see on the outside... It says clearly that which you can see on the outside, you have to look deeper and you have to find it intimated in the words and the verses and the structure and an extra word and a missing word. It's like a blueprint of the human being. When you look at a person, I could see what a person looks like. I could see what they, I can hear what they say. I could see what they do. Their inner experience, even they themselves may not always know it. You have to look deeper and deeper to get to those layers. When we look at Yosef's evolution, the Torah clearly articulates it, but it articulates it in a way that you have to listen to it and find it, tune into it. If you look in the next source, we now go back all the way to the beginning of the Parsha, which starts with chapter 37, Lamed Zion. And the Torah says in Pasuk Beis, the beginning of Ayeshev, the second Pasuk of Ayeshev, Ela told us, Yaakov Yosef, this is the beginning of the story of Yosef. Yosef ben Shmaes Rishana Yeroya Sechav Batzayin. Yosef is 17 years old. He's shepherding with his, he's shepherding with his brother, the sheep, they're tending to the sheep. Remember, their father had lots of sheep. We discussed that a few weeks ago, Parshas Vayetze. The whole Parshas Vayetze is all about sheep and more sheep and more sheep. So there was a lot of sheep to deal with. V'hunar es bnei vilas bnei zilpa neshayaviv. He was young, and as Rashi says, he behaved as a youthful person. He behaved, oisa maisa nairus, Rashi says. He behaved in a childlike fashion. The words of Rashi, very interesting Rashi, wasn't even who nar, he was young. Yeah, if he's 17 years old, he was pretty young. So Rashi explains, he quotes the Medrash, He was playful and youthful. He spent time with his hair, fixing his hair, beautifying his eyes. Yosef, as we know, was a beautiful, beautiful child, and he tended to it. He took care of it. <coughs> And he was together with the children of Bila and Zilpa, his half-brothers, the wives of his father. And Yosef spoke negatively about his brothers to their father. He was shepherding with his brothers. And Rashi says that Yosef would come to his father and share things that were raw, that were negative about the brothers. Now there's a lot of different layers of interpretation here what exactly he said, what was his motivation. What happens afterwards? The, the Torah continues and says, describes the story, that Yaakov has a special love to Yosef. He's his oldest son. I mean, there was one more older one. I mean, ki ben skunim huloi. Ben skunim huloi means he's a son who was born ready when he was older. And of course, as Mepharshim explained, he was Rachel's oldest son. And he was born when he was Older and Ben Skunim also means he felt there was a special 
uh, uh, wisdom, wisdom and depth that Yosef had. He made him the special multicolored shirt. The brothers see this love and they don't like Yosef. I used to know Yosef. They loathe him. It's hard for them to communicate with him peacefully. If that's not enough, the Torah describes two dreams that he had. And Yosef decide to share, decide to share with them these dreams. In the first dream, they're all out in the field. Farmers binding stalks of grain together, making sheaves, bundles. And every one of their sheaves stands up straight and erect. But then they all bow down to Yosef's sheep. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I said they all stood up. Sorry. Yosef's sheave stands up straight, stands erect in the dream. And then all of their sheaves prostrate themselves to his. The brothers loathe him for this dream even more because they feel he is basically saying, I'm going to be the king over you. You're all going to kneel to me. You're all going to be subservient to me. And the second dream doesn't help much either when he dreams of the sun and the moon and 11 stars. Of course, he has 11 brothers who will all kneel down to him. The sun will kneel and the moon will kneel and the 11 stars will kneel. Yaakov Avinu says, what do you think? We're all going to come bow down to you. The brothers are jealous, although Yaakov remembers the dream. That's the story that the Torah says. Now, obviously, the story has a lot inside of it. And over thousands of years, commentators and Midrashim and Svarim explored it and explained it on many, many different levels. But one thing we can see from the spirit, the light motive, as you would say, the, the energy, the subplot, that is the plot that's conveyed here is that Yosef is, stands out. He's a person with big dreams. He has a lot of ambition. He has tremendous potential. He's also very creative. He's also saying exactly what he thinks. You know, his father says, Yosef, shh. <laughs> shh. But Yosef shares with his brothers what he, said, what he thinks. Yosef has his dreams. Now Yaakov, who's the father of all of them, has a special love for Yosef. He sees, obviously... A diamond, he sees a light, he sees some dazzling brilliance in Yosef, which, is, which sets him apart, which is unique. And just from Yosef's dreams, you could see he's a, he's a very young boy, 17 years old, but essentially he's dreaming of, uh, you could call it world conquest. Remember, agriculture then is what real estate is today. <laughs> You own the field. That was, I mean, today agriculture is also important. We can't live without agriculture. We just don't realize it because we go to the store and buy challah or we go to the store and buy bread. But agriculture is the basis of life, of course. So it's important. A dream about agriculture is a dream really about economic prosperity and success. And if that's not enough, that's earth. He starts dreaming about heaven. Even the sun and the moon and the stars are somehow under his influence. So he's both controlling the agriculture on earth, he's, he's controlling astronomy in heaven, both agriculture and science and astronomy and cosmology, and there's vision, the sun gives light and the moon gives light, and the stars with their unique properties and power. There's a lot in these dreams. The brothers are jealous of him, the brothers don't like him. Yosef also is telling his brothers about his issues with his, Yosef is telling his father about his issues with his brothers, he's not hiding anything. He tells his father, this is what my brothers are doing, this is what they think, this is what they say, this is what their behavior is like. Still, Yaakov, who's trying to make peace, does not hide his tremendous love to Yosef, makes him this special colorful tunic because obviously he sees his great potential. But here, something is absolutely, something changes in the most radical way. Yosef would seem like hoping to grow up in a very normal way and have a normal life and then maybe one day materialize his dreams. He's still a young man. He's 17 years old. But then what happens is we all know the continuation of the story. His life takes a turn that he couldn't expect and certainly his father, couldn't, his father also didn't expect and couldn't believe that it happened and didn't even know that it happened. And what happens here is he goes to shepherd he go, his father asks him to go visit the brothers. The brothers have went off to Shechem. That's where they're shepherding with Yaakov's sheep. And Yaakov summons Yosef one day and says, can I go send you to your brothers and see how they're doing? And Yosef turns to his father and says, he neini. I'm going. And he goes. And the Torah tells the story how on the way to Shechem, he founds, finds a person who sees that he's lost. 
And the man says, what are you searching for? And Yosef says, I'm searching for my brothers. And uh, I want to know where they're shepherding. And the man tells him, they left from here. Nasu mizeh. They left from here. They, they're gone. They left. I heard they said they're going to go to a place called Doisan. And Yosef follows them. Yosef follows that path. And before he arrives, they see him coming and they plot to kill him. The way the Torah says it is one man tells his brother, the, oh, the Bala Chaloimas, the master of the dreams is coming. Let's kill him. Let's throw him into one of the cisterns. We'll say that a wild animal has molded him, has consumed him. We'll see what happens to his dreams. And that's when Reuven says, let's not kill him. Let's throw him into one of the cisterns because Reuven wants to bring him home back to his father. As Yosef is taking this journey, he can't, not, he can't know what's going to happen. Nobody knows what's going to happen. He thinks he's going to check out on his brothers, and even though the relationship is tense, okay, but he's still going to check on him. That's what his father wants. And he'll come back and tell his father what's going on with the brothers, how the brothers are doing, how the sheep are doing, etc. Obviously, if Yaakov sent him there, Yaakov didn't expect that there could be this consequence. He didn't expect this level of tension in the family. And Yosef didn't expect it. Why would he go put himself in such danger? This strange story about a man meeting him and asking him, where do you have to go? You're lost. What are you looking for? I'm looking for my brothers. It's difficult because even if it happened, it happens constantly. You're traveling somewhere, especially before the days of ways, and you don't have directions, and you ask somebody for directions. Why is that relevant to the story? It's difficult to understand why it's relevant to the story. Okay, so Yosef needed directions, so somebody gave him directions. We don't have such stories in Tanakh. Very, very rare that the Torah starts pointing out details that aren't relevant to the story. He stopped in the, you used to, you remember before ways, he stopped in the gas station for directions, or he actually asked your husband to stop, and he said, I know, I don't have to stop. And then three hours later, you're on the way to Miami when you had to be in California, you had to be in JFK. Remember those days. Of course, Waze and Google Maps have saved a lot of Shalom Bayes issues because... Baruch Hashem's other things to fight about, but that issue of, unless he still doesn't listen to ways either, because it triggers him in some way. I told him they shouldn't have a woman's voice, <coughs> because it's hard for men to listen. But in any case, before the days of ways, fine, you stop and ask for directions. I mean, it's, and that's why Rashi says it was a malach. Rashi says it's a whole different story. There was an angel... And when the angel said they went to Dyson, he meant something else. He meant that they are looking for ways of eliminating you. It's a whole different story. The Ramban, Ramban writes, interestingly, he says, of course it was an angel, but an angel doesn't always look like an angel. An angel sometimes looks like a regular person. When you say an angel, it doesn't necessarily mean an angel. You know, we imagine an angel with wings flying around. He says an angel could sometimes, we don't know what an angel looks like. The angel could be the person standing right in front of me. The angel could be the stranger, I don't know. What the Ramban says is, here is an example of people becoming messengers for stories that they themselves don't know how they're going to play out. And the point is that here is a story happening. Yosef is on a journey that he doesn't expect. And for that journey to happen, there's a lot of different people who become players in this story, not even consciously. But if that wouldn't have happened, then Yosef would have never found his brothers. The whole story couldn't happen. Now this man who gave him directions, according to the Ramban, never knew that he was responsible for Yosef being thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, becoming a prisoner, becoming the prime minister of Egypt, saving his entire family from hunger, and then having the Jews in Egypt for 210 years. And then having them become a people and go into Mount Sinai and receive the Torah. All he was doing was giving directions. <laughs> But you think about it, Ramban says, that's how life works. It's exactly how life works. I'm just giving you directions. But this person becomes an indispensable note in the cosmic symphony, if you will, or the cosmic plan. And every person is that note, sometimes consciously, much more often unconsciously. And so the story continues. And when Yosef comes to his brothers, a whole different story develops. The last words we heard from Yosef was he nani. He told his father he nani. Since then there is absolute silence on Yosef's part. His brother sees him. Oh, he the man says what are you looking for? He says I'm looking for my brothers. After that moment we don't hear him speak anymore. His brother sees him. What did he tell them? They wanted to kill him. Doesn't say a word. They take off his tunic. What did he say? Tyre doesn't say anything. They're about to throw him into a pit. What does he say? The Torah doesn't say anything. Later, it's going to say in Parshish Miketz that the brothers told each other when they were in prison in Egypt, we're guilty. 
because we heard our brother's cries pleading with us and we didn't listen to him. Does that mean he was pleading verbally? Does it mean he was crying? Does it mean he was sobbing? The Torah doesn't say it in the story here. In the story here, Yosef doesn't say a word. Is it possible that Yosef didn't speak? It's just his eyes. He was pleading with his eyes. Maybe the shock and the pain was too deep. He couldn't even speak. So the Torah doesn't say anything. As I told you, silence in Tanakh is very loud. <laughs> silence in Chumash is thundering. When something is not written, it's not because it doesn't exist. It's because you have to absorb it with different tools. Silence you can't absorb through words. Silence you have to absorb through silence. Is Yosef's silence his greatest cry, his deepest cry? The Zohar has an expression, sometimes the deepest sounds... You can't hear. You know, sometimes a person could cry and articulate themselves in words. Usually when the pain is deep and very deep, there's no words. They can just cry. And sometimes the pain is so deep, they can't even cry. Not because there's no pain. You have to be able to see it in their eyes. It's just, it's, it's, it's internalized in such a powerful place that even tears don't capture it. Sometimes there is no verbal structure for it. It's pre-verbal. Certainly in a child, but even in an adult. In children, it happens very often. The pain is pre-verbal. And even in a place that's pre-tears, so it's not articulated, it doesn't have a keli. And when it doesn't have a keli, it doesn't have a vessel, you know where it stays. It stays deep, deep inside, because it's not articulated. And then it could be everywhere all the time. That's one of the powerful definitions of real trauma that happens at such a young age. But, so Yosef is quiet as far as we know. They take him out of the pit and they sell him. Does he say anything? Not a word. I don't know that he said or didn't say anything. Not a word. He comes to Egypt. He's bought by a master. Does he say anything? Not a word. We do not hear another word of Yosef. See, these are things, when you read it, we often don't focus on it. I'm thankful to Nechama Leibowitz her in commentary on Chumash points out this detail. From Yosef leaving his father and saying, Hineni, I'm look, and I'm looking for my brothers... We do not hear another word from this man. Even though there was so much going on in his life. The kid was thrown into a pit, sold as a slave, bought as a slave. He's running the entire show. He's the CEO of Petifar. We know what he does. We know that he's liked. We know that he's loved. We know that Petifar trusts him. We know Petifar's wife likes him. We all know that. He still did not say a word. What's the first word he says? Or I should say, what are the first words? He, he, he certainly said words, but not recorded in Torah. That's what I mean. I'm not saying he didn't speak. <laughs> he spoke, but it's not recorded in Chumash. What are the first words recorded by Yosef, from Yosef? From the day he left his father and the day he met that, that strange, mysterious man who asked him where he's going. And finally, when he opens his mouth next, recorded, when the, finally when we hear him speak, when words are emitted from his mouth in Chumash, huh? that's going to be later. That's, we need 22 years for that. The first words are, and this is very interesting, Poitifar's wife, as we know, takes a liking to him. And this is in your next source, Lamed Tes Pasig Vav. Those few verses, it's one, two, it's the fourth paragraph in the source sheets. She says to him, be with me, lay with me. He refuses and he speaks to her. This is the first conversation. First words of Yosef from before he was sold, before he met his brothers, till now is his conversation, not with Paitifar, with the wife of Paitifar. He speaks to her, he explains to her why this would be wrong. And he says, you know that my master knows nothing of what's going in this what knows nothing of what's going on in this house. Anything that he has, he has put under my jurisdiction. There is no one greater in this home. The only thing he did not give me was you, because you're his wife. And the last line he says, How can I do? Something that is so immoral, so wrong, so bad, and I will be sinning to Hashem, to God. That's the first conversation we hear from Yosef. He's speaking to the wife of Petifra. He's trying to persuade her and to explain to her why he's refusing her. Of course, she wasn't convinced by this, but this is what Yosef tells her. So, and he's making an argument. He says, this will be such a betrayal of your husband and of you. <laughs> 
Your husband trusted me with everything. The one thing I don't have access to is you because you're his wife. You're married. This is not my, this is not me. This doesn't belong to me. How can I do this? How can I betray my, your, your husband? How can I betray you? And finally, his last words is, V'chatasi lelikim. I'm going to sin to God. By the way, just a little interesting thing. I saw this, I think, from the Kutzker Rebbe, CX Avergadish. He says, V'chatasi lelikim. He says, he should have told us something more powerful. V'chatanu lelikim. It's a sin for you too. It's one of the Sheva Mitzvahs B'nai Noyach. Adultery is one of the Sheva Mitzvahs B'nai Noyach. So even if it's before Matan Torah, it's also, you're, you're not allowed to do this, Petifar's wife. He should say, V'chatanu lelikim. Not V'chatasi. It's going to be a sin for me because you're married, but it's a sin for you too. And he said something very powerful. He said, Yosef did not want to put himself with her in one group, even in a moral way. V'chatanu would mean we're, we're ready, we have a, a partnership here. <clears throat> you know, we'll be learning together, you know. <laughs> you know, when the boy tells me, we're just learning together. V'chatanu le'elekim. We're going to be sinning to God. Even that! It's already a connection and Yosef would be crossing a border that is very, very dangerous. You see the precision of his words. Think what lay in that. Not v'chatanu. You're going to sin to God too. You'll have to figure that out. But I'm going to tell you, that created a boundary, not just in terms of the relationship, but even in the terms of how to talk about the relationship. It's not, we're going to sin to God. Oh, we already, we're already in this together. We're both going to sin. No, I'm going to sin to God. I'm sorry, I'm going to sin to God. I can't do this. This is the end of the first conversation of Yosef. Yosef, from now on, is silent again doesn't talk. Not that he didn't talk. Nothing is recorded. We do know that one day nobody is home. She's home alone and Yosef is home. This is her day. She seizes him and she says, come on. And what Yosef does is he runs out of the house. His cloak is torn and she uses it as proof that he was guilty of attempting to do a horrible, heinous, immoral act, and he's thrown into prison. We would expect him to say something. I'm sure he told his master he's innocent, he didn't want to go to prison. But, Torah doesn't record a word. Just like when his brothers threw him into the pit. He sold him to say, he doesn't say a word. No, we don't hear a word. Where do we hear him again speak? He's in prison. And again, he's appointed over the prison, he's the CEO, he's loved, Hashem gives him atzlacha. We still don't hear a word from him. And then one day, one day, years after him being in prison, the two ministers of Parai are in prison. The butler and the baker. And Yosef comes one morning, it's a second to the last source, and they look depressed and sour and dejected. In Yiddish it's called Zohar Zoyer in Panim, they have a sour face. They look like sour pickles, they look like, they look depressed. And Yosef turns to him and he says, Madu raim, I am chavra. What's wrong? Why do you guys look downcast? Why do your faces look melancholy? So they tell him, we have a dream. We had a dream and nobody can explain our dream. So here is finally Yosef again. Shears words. Madu raim. Why are you guys upset? And they say, we had a dream. What does Yosef say? Vayoyim raleim. Yosef, haloi leiloikim pisroinim. God has the solutions. Tell me your dream. God has the solutions. Tell me your dream. They tell him the dream. Yosef interprets the dreams. His interpretations come true. The butler is restored. Back to his position. The baker is exodus. Hung by Parai. Years again pass. We don't hear Yosef talking. <laughs> Until Parai has a dream. Two dreams. And the butler remembers. And he tells Parai there's a great kid in prison who knows how to interpret dreams. And they summon Yosef. And Parai tells Yosef, I had this dream and nobody can explain it. And I heard you know how to explain dreams. And once again, Yosef speaks. Third time since he was sold. Vayan Yosef is Parai Lamer, Bil Odoi, Elohim, Yana Shloim Parai. It's not me. I can't interpret your dreams. Hashem will respond to the welfare of Parai. And Parai shares the dream. Yosef gives an interpretation. Then he tells Parai, the reason Hashem showed you this dream is because there's something happening. There's going to be a plenty, years of plenty, years of famine. The reason you have the dream twice 
is because Hashem is showing you that this is going to happen very soon. Yosef tells him what Hashem shows him, and he uses the word Elikim again. So now understand, in all three conversations that Yosef has from when he was sent away from his father, there's a word that he keeps on saying, and that is Elikim. When he speaks to Paitif for his wife, the first conversation, his last words is, V'chatosi le'elikim. When he speaks to the butler and baker in the prison cell, when they tell him we have a dream and we're bothered, we're perturbed, he says, God has the solution, but you can share it with me. And fun, fascinatingly, when Paroi asks him about his dream, he says, exactly, almost the same thing he told to the butler and baker in prison. And those are the three subsequent conversations from his silence. But these three conversations capture the evolution of Yosef. And once we see these three, you'll see this word again and again and again and again throughout until the punchline. 22 years later, after everything, he was by Poitifa, he was in prison, he was a prime minister, he dealt with plenty, he dealt with famine, he fed his family, he arrested Shimon, he forced him to bring Binyamin. And finally, finally, when Yehuda confronts him because Binyamin is going to be the slave because he supposedly stole his goblet and Yosef can't contain himself anymore. It's 22 years since the sale as a slave. And he says, Ani Yosef achichem, I am Yosef, your brothers. And he uses three times in that opening sentence the word Elikim. Yosef says to them, to his brothers, they're shocked, they're overwhelmed, they're afraid there's going to be revenge, retribution. Who knows how Yosef is going to respond to the fact that they are his brothers, what is he going to do to them? And Yosef tells them, don't get depressed, you did not sell me. Elikim has sent me to bring life to everybody. Because there's already a hunger for two years, going to be a hunger for another five years. A second time. So Hashem sent me ahead of you to bring rescue and life and survival. And then he says to them, and you did not send me, Ki Elikim. Elikim sent me and he made me the master over this country. Go back home, tell our father and bring him to Egypt. So in his, the sentence where the family is reunited, he uses Elikim three times. Here it's three different times. He uses Elikim to Petifra's wife, Elikim to the butler and baker, Elikim to Parai. There three times he uses the word Elikim. Is that a coincidence that it's three times? No, it's capturing those three Elikims which are the only conversations we have from when he opened his mouth, but it's this way that the Torah conveys a message. What's the message? The message is, Yosef has potential that is unimaginable. Yaakov knows it. That's the love that he has to Yosef. When people have such potential, potential must be nurtured. You can have the greatest seed in the world. This seed, its genetic makeup, can produce a tree as and as elches. But if this seed is not nurtured, if it doesn't have a good place in the soil, if it doesn't have good soil, if it doesn't get oxygen, if it doesn't get sunlight, if it doesn't get water, what happens to the seed? Garnished, bupkis, zero. The seed decomposes and that's the end of it. You could have left it on your windowsill at least. It would have had something. I put it in the ground, I bury it, I destroy it and there's nothing there. You need to give it water. You need to give it sunlight. Yosef is a seed. Every child, every person is a seed. We call it zera. Zera means a seed. In, in Hebrew, children are called zera. Right? Zera Avram, zera Yitzchak, zera actually comes the word zria. It's planting. Why? So the answer is, well, because every child comes from a seed, the seed of life. Every living organism comes from a seed. But that's how we call children. Why is that the Hebrew name for children? Right, Lizaracha. The main name in Torah for children is Lizaracha etines aritzazes. It doesn't mean your children. It means to your seed. It's a very profound idea because it tells you what a child is. A child is a seed. What happens to a seed? What happens to a sperm? What happens to the seed of life? Well, if you put it under a microscope, it's incredible. <laughs> We may not see it with our physical eyes, but if you put it under a microscope and you study a little biology and you know what is contained in a seed, it's incredible. A world is contained in a seed, a universe. The planning, the intricacy, the brilliance, the infrastructure of a single seed 
is so complex, it's so profound, it's so powerful. It's more sophisticated and takes more work to assemble than the infrastructure of New York and London and Paris and Moscow and Sydney and Melbourne and even Tel Aviv put together. Cities have infrastructures and they're complex. <laughs> Today we know they used to think a cell, a cell is a simple thing. Today you know what's inside of a cell is so complex that it's more complex than all of these infrastructures put together. This couldn't happen randomly. This is a brilliant, brilliant design, a manifestation of infinite intelligence. And this is one seed, one cell, one neuron, one scroll of DNA, one genome. A child is called Zerah, Lezaracha etin. Why? The potential of Yosef is stupendous. It's gigantic. I wanted to use the word titanic, but that doesn't belong here. And the word is a good word, but <laughs> became associated with something else. You know, there's, there's words like that, that over the history, you can't... Yeah, the, the word in English for joy, it's a very, very nice word. In old literature, it's used constantly, you know what I mean? Ecstasy and another word, too. But the point is, you have to always know the context. But it's interesting because the potential of Yosef is so magnificent. But that's what a seed is. A seed needs hands a heart, water, sunlight to nurture it, a physical seed, and of course, a spiritual seed, a psychological seed, an emotional seed. Yaakov gives him this Ksenis Pasim. It's not just a shirt. It's a sign of a special relationship, of, of, of an investment in Yosef's future, in his well-being. His destiny is great. Yosef is still young. Now, what I'm going to say now, we have to always understand that when we're dealing with Yosef and the brothers, you're talking about extremely lofty and profound souls. So we always have to have the respect and the awe and the reverence. But I'm saying it in a way, of, in a language that can relate to us. Rashi says, Oisa Nairus. However you explain it with Yosef, there was still a youthfulness in Yosef. I don't mean youthfulness in a good sense, you know, you're youthful, you're fun, creative. But youthfulness in the sense that Yosef still needed to develop relative to his level and relative to his potential. He's still telling his father how his brothers are not good. Whatever that means and however you explain it again, relative to Yosef's level. He's telling his brothers that you're all going to bow down to me. Now Yosef was a good person. Yosef was an innocent person. Yosef was a holy person. Yosef was a pure person. We see how he rises throughout life. But at this stage, Yosef is still telling his brothers these dreams, which is so misconstrued in their minds and absorbed and taken by them as a form of narcissism or a form of control. You're going to control us. You're going to be our king. You're going to rule over us. And all they can respond is with hatred. They hate him. They loathe him. They're jealous of him. How is Yosef's potential going to emerge? Now the fascinating thing is, what do you do with a seed? <laughs> what do we do with a seed? We don't keep it on the windowsill. A seed we put into the earth. That's what we do. Who's put into the earth? Yosef. How many times? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. How many times does it say he's in a bur? What's the word we use for a, a, a cave or a pit in the earth? Bur. How many? Twice. His brothers put him into a bur. Later, when he speaks to the butler, he says, I was stolen from the land of the Hebrews, and they placed me in a bur in Egypt. The prison cell was in a pit. It was underground. It was subterranean. Yosef was put in a bar twice. The Torah says about Yosef's pit, It was an empty pit without water. Why does it say that? It could have just said, It was empty. So he didn't drown. Chazal asked this question. It's very difficult to understand. The pit was empty. That means there was no water. There was also no diamonds there. <laughs> One of the interpretations is, I could put a seed in the earth. But if there's no water, nothing is going to grow. So Yosef is put into the earth. But you need water. You need sunlight. You need air. Earth is not enough. But what happens right after that, right after Yosef is put into the pit with there's no water, the brothers realize that he's, the brothers, uh, Reuven realizes that he's gone, he was sold. And what do they do? They send a message to Yaakov with a bloody tunic, and Yaakov believes that Yosef was killed by an animal. 
And the next thing the Torah describes is how Yaakov would not stop crying for Yosef. And he says, I'm going to go down to my grave, grieving, weeping, sobbing for Yosef. That juxtaposition is not a coincidence. Yaakov's tears were the waters that irrigated Yosef's soul. How do we know this? Because later when Poitifar wants Yosef to behave promiscuously, and Chazal say Rashi brings it, Yosef came home that day to do his work, and some of the sages say he surrendered. What stopped him? Our sages say he saw the image of Yaakov, his father. What does that mean? He knew what Yaakov looked like before. He was 17 years old when he left his father. Yosef suddenly can feel his father's presence, his father's attachment. A father who never stopped crying. Because as Rashi says, for someone who's gone, there is pain. But a person can somehow find closure. When a person is alive, there's no closure. Yosef was alive, there was no closure. I'm not going to elaborate, but everybody knows the difference when parents are dealing with a child in captivity or children have a parent in captivity or a sibling, etc., a close relative, a grandparent. It's a different experience. This, the limbo, the, the chaos, the confusion, the overwhelming sense of dread. Yosef wasn't dead. He was alive. Yaakov could sense something is wrong. He doesn't stop crying. But think about it on a spiritual level. On a spiritual level, Yaakov never considered Yosef dead. So in other words, Yaakov kept up that attachment. Think of it in terms of spiritually. Sometimes parents could chalila sever a relationship with a child and I stop crying, I'm done. He's in a pit, he's a slave, I don't know. His life was lost. Yaakov says, not my son. I'm not going to sever that attachment. Those tears irrigate the pits of Yosef throughout his life. But what happens in that boyer? Usually, when someone is thrown into a boyer, it's the end. It's a recipe for absolute depression. It's a recipe for absolute decomposition. In life, sometimes a person feels that they have been buried. And that's what happened to Yosef. He was buried, not once. Buried by his brothers. Buried by Poitifar. Buried by the butler. Whenever anybody can, they buried him. This boy did not stop being buried. Everyone he came in contact with buried him. And why? He was doing the right thing. He could have told his father, Tati, could you find another messenger? He wanted to listen to his father. He nanny. So he went to a place of danger. He could have told Petit for his wife, sure, <laughs> I want to stay in this house. You know, I'm the CEO. I'm doing well. He was moral. So he said no. So what did he get for that? Buried, thrown into prison. He was nice to the butler. He interpreted his dream. He asked him for a favor. Get me out of this place. The butler forgets about him. That's how Vayeshev ends. He forgot about him. That's the end. It took two years till Pare had a dream. And often in life, somebody feels they were buried and buried again and buried again. And what does Yosef teach somebody? Yosef says, you weren't buried, you were planted. You weren't buried, you were planted. That's a very big difference. <laughs> I could take a seed and bury it. I can take a seed and plant it. You know the difference? When I take a seed and bury it, it's the end. When I take a seed and plant it, it's the beginning. That's the transformation this man goes through, this young child, this young man goes through. As he was broken, he lost everything. He found something. What did he find? He found an identity that was of a completely different magnitude. And it's this identity that the Torah is intimating with that evolution from slavery into prison. Because here itself, there was another evolution. Let's think about the difference between a slave and a prisoner. Being a slave is not fun. Let's put it that way. We don't have to discuss the story of the slaves in the American South. We don't have to discuss the story of slaves in the Roman Empire. In Judaism, when you buy a Jewish slave in Tyre, you have to liberate him after six years. And as the Gemara says, when you buy a Jewish slave, you're basically buying a master. So be careful. 
If you have one piece of chicken, he gets it. In Judaism, even if you buy a non-Jewish slave, an Evet Knaini, if you kill him, you get killed. Think about that. <laughs> In the ancient world, you killed a slave, you owned your slave. You could do with it what you do with your table. In the Jewish world, you kill an Evet Knaini, you get killed. And there's serious punishments, there's serious penalties. If you knock out his tooth, he goes free, because they used to knock out a tooth to be able to show that you're a slave. So if you run away, everybody will see you're a slave. So if you do that, he goes free. So this was, there was regulation on the seventh day, every slave had to rest. Every slave had to rest. He could sit in shul with Mizrach together with his boss. So even in the world of slavery, there was a unique sense of dignity, but in the ancient world generally, a slave didn't belong to himself. But there's still a difference between a slave and a prisoner. When Paitifar buys a slave, he wants the slave to be successful. He wants the slave to flex his muscles. He wants the slave to rise to the top. That's why he buys him. He's happy that Yosef is a successful man, right? He doesn't want Yosef to be repressed and crushed and despondent and depressed. He wants Yosef to be his CEO. He tells Yosef, take it over. Do whatever you want. You're my slave. <laughs> the money goes into my bank account. Yes. You, be you belong to me. But I want you to work. I want you to be successful. And if I, you need a good meal, take it. And you need a good bed, take it. It's my bed. It's my meal. But I want you to work and I want you to be successful. That's why I hire somebody. Let's think about it in terms of contemporary life, not the words of slavery. When I hire somebody, an employee, a manager, I want them to be powerful. Sometimes you'll pay a very big salary to get somebody who's a really successful person and can have their own company, right? So why do you hire him? Because you want success. You want success. You don't want to have to change every light bulb and overlook everything he's doing. You want to be able to delegate. The best thing is to delegate. That's Petifa. I want to delegate. So when I hire somebody, he may be working for me, or she may be working for me. I'm paying their salary. The profits are going to me ultimately. But I want you to be successful. I want you to be creative. I want you to use your imagination. Even if I am ultimately gaining so much from it because I'm the boss. But now let's think about a prisoner. Prisoner is the exact opposite. You don't call in a prisoner and say, I want you to work and be successful and be creative. The word asir, asurim, what does asurim mean in Hebrew? Asur? Bound up. Matir, we say every day, Baruch atah Hashem alekeinu melech Matir, asurim. You untie, you release those who are tied. Asur means tied. Kashur. Asur b'masarot. The word isur, why is isur called isur? Forbidden. Why is it called isur? Because it's tied. Yeah. A person is tied. I'm not, this, like Yosef told her, this is not for me. My hands are tied. I, I'm not supposed to touch you. When I was a little kid, my mother told me an interesting story. She said that there was once years ago, there was a Jewish secular woman and she came to see the Lubavitcher Rebbe. So naturally she stuck out her hand to shake his hand. So he looked at her, and in the most polite way he said, when I was still a little kid, my mother taught me not to touch something that doesn't belong to me. <laughs> when I was a little kid, my mother taught me not to touch something that doesn't belong to me. <laughs> usur, I'm usur. The word isur also means something else. The thing is, is blocked, because this, everything has a spark of the divine. So something that's kosher, that's mutar. Mutar means untied. You can extract the spark. But if it's asur, it means the spark is not accessible to me. So if I eat this food, I'm not helping the food, I'm not helping me because I'm not connecting to the divine energy and the spark. So when you say asur, a prisoner in a base asurim, it's tied. You don't want to tie your servant. You don't want to tie your employee. You don't want to tie the hands and the feet and the imagination. You want your employee to be creative. You want them to come in and think and dream. That's what you're paying for. That's why you bought this Eved or you hired this employee. A, a, a prisoner, no, they turn you into a number. <laughs> I'm not interested in your creativity. On the contrary, this is a place where you're not going to be able to express yourself. You're behind closed doors. You can't get out of your cell. Everything is prescribed. Everything is controlled. Even if you're doing work, maybe you'll clean the bathroom in the prison. Or you'll clean the chaplain or you'll clean. But the point is to, to, to crush your dignity. You become a number instead of a person. That's what Beis HaSurim does. Even if a prisoner does work in prison, many of them, you have jobs, but it's not a job, you know, you're going to write home about, I got an amazing job and my talents are being expressed here and manifested. It's a whole different reality. 
So now think about Yosef's two stages. What happens in his journey after he comes to his brothers, he gets sold. Yosef now doesn't break. He actually transforms. And he transforms into a new person. And this new person is a person who he will oh, one day identify when he meets his, when he reunites with his brothers in a revealed way. And he'll tell them, you did not sell me. Hashem sent me. And that changes everything. As we've spoken in, in, in classes in previous years of these portions, there's always the choice a person makes in life. Was I sold or was I sent? The circumstances are the same. Was I buried or was I planted? It's the same reality. <laughs> the seed was put in the earth and it was dark there. But what was happening? Was it decomposing in order to turn into an incredible tree or an incredible plant or vegetable, fruit, herb, whatever it is? Or it was just buried to be destroyed and let to die? At that moment, Yosef realizes, I did not plan this. I was sent. My dreams will come true, <laughs> but how they're going to come true, I don't know. It's going to be a whole different journey. He trusted it so deeply that he was ready to let go of everything. But there were two stages in letting go. And these two stages are both very profound. But it's only after the second stage when he becomes the king of Egypt, the prime minister of Egypt. In other words, he gains power more than he could have imagined as a 17-year-old. As a 17-year-old, his brother's sheaves are bowing down to him. Okay, nice. So you own a couple of you know, pieces of real estate in Munsi. Shite, nitsch gefährlich. The second one is already a sun and a moon. Could have he imagined that he would become the prime minister of the world power? Remember, Egypt was the superpower of the time. Pare said, this is your country. <laughs> Only the throne is above you. Just like Petitra told him, just like the prison warden told him, everybody tells him the same thing. It's yours. Egypt is yours. <laughs> Nobody should lift an arm or a leg in all of Egypt without your permission. That's what Pari told him. That transformation happens after the second phase in Yosef's evolution. So here is the key and the magic of Yosef's thinking. When Yosef tells his brother, his brothers, Hashem sent me, you didn't sell me, he wasn't denying the fact that they sold him. Of course they sold him. What he meant was, I am reframing the experience as a mission rather than me just being a victim of your horrible mistakes, of your sinister moves for whatever reason. You did what you did for your reasons. You will have to be able to find the healing for that. As far as I'm concerned, I was a messenger. I was an ambassador of Hashem. This is my journey. I'm going to own it. And I'm going to own it with grace. I'm going to own it with optimism. I'm going to own it with fortitude, resilience, resolve, confidence, and faith and empowerment. But this is not just a general description. It's easy to say, I was sent in life. One second, you were sent? You're a slave, for heaven's sake. <laughs> this is where Yosef actually took the experience of life and the circumstances he was experiencing, and he channeled it as a tool for extraordinary growth. So when he is a slave in Potiphar's house, you know what he asks himself? Hmm. Wow, what is it that I need to learn from slavery? Where is the growth here? I'm just, my life is over. <laughs> I was a free, happy-go-lucky boy, dreaming, <laughs> soaring in my imagination. Pa pa Papa loved me. Okay, my brothers didn't. Lived a beautiful life, physically, spiritually. He didn't have a mother, so life was never completely perfect. But compared to now, he's an Evid, and in Egypt, he's the only Jew in all of Egypt. It's not just he was in another person's house. The culture was alien. It was a pagan culture. It was Erva Saaretz. Shtufei Zimut says they were saturated with promiscuity. When Petifor's wife heard no from Yosef, she must have been shocked. <laughs> Nobody said no in Egypt. It was Erva Saaretz. It's like what we're hearing now, what happened with the Hamasniks on October 7th, Yemach their relationship to, to the respect for a person's body, the absence of it. It's unconceivable, inconceivable for, for, for people, for Jewish women especially. 
who were the Jewish people were nurtured for thousands of years on the ethos of, of respect for the body, respect for boundaries, the dignity of another person. You're facing a culture that not only does these things in hiding, you know, the Nazis did a lot of these things, but they didn't take videos. They didn't want anybody to know. They didn't want anybody to know. The Hamasniks took videos. They wanted everybody to know. Wow, that's like, in other words, it's not like I know it's wrong, but I want to do it, so I'm not going to take videos. No! This is what God wants. Allah Akbar. It, it gives you an understanding, a little bit of a, what depravity means. What the Jewish people are up against. It also gives you an understanding of the people supporting Hamas in Western countries of the levels of indoctrination and blindness and stupidity or anti-Semitism that we're seeing. Potiphar's wife must have been shocked. So now when Yosef, Yosef refuses, he's one person alone. And he asks the question, what's the goal here? Where am I? I was planted. What am I going to become? And you know what happens? Yosef is transformed. He becomes an Eved Hashem. The experience of servitude doesn't remain an experience where I'm a slave to Potiphar. I'm working in Potiphar's house. I'm a servant of Hashem. That's why he could tell his brothers, Hashem sent me. I'm working for Hashem. Mashakana Evet Kana Rabbi. Halachically, what the slave acquires, the master acquires. That's what the Gemara says in Kedushan. What the servant acquires, the master acquires. Why? I belong to him. And that's why you see the Pasuk, the moment he becomes a slave, there's a new language with Yosef. Hashem is with him. Petifer sees Hashem is with him. Whatever he does, he's matzlich. Hashem, Hashem, Hashem. You don't have that before with Yosef. Now, of course, Yosef was the son of Yaakov. Yosef was a tzaddik. But there was an incredible transformation in his life. The fact that he lost so much didn't destroy him. As his old identity was lost, something new was born. The seed gave growth. The first boy, the first boy, the boy that his brothers threw him into gave growth to a new identity. A person where the ego, even the smallest ego relative to his great level, was now gone. And he defined himself as, I'm a servant, I'm a channel. I'm a conduit. And that's why it says, Hashem atzliach biyadoi. Hashem had atzlacha through Yadai, through his hand. But something else happens. He's thrown into a second bar. Why? The seed was already planted once. No, it was planted again. This was a prison. What happens in a prison? In a prison, they look at you and they say, you're nothing, you're a number. At least a slave. I want you to work. I want you to be successful in prison. I don't want you to be successful. I want you to be depressed. <laughs> I want to punish you. Every day is a punishment. You're being punished. You're being confined. What does Yosef do with that? This is where Yosef becomes Yosef. This is where Yosef has to go into a space where he's not only a servant of Hashem, but where he completely, completely lets go of every last vestige of self-consciousness that is separate from the source of life. What do they do to a person in prison? One message. You're a nothing. You're nobody. Work? <laughs> CEO? No, you're not a CEO. You're going to rot here. If one day you get out, you'll go home. That's the point of prison. No, you can't be with a family. No. Prison is there to break a person. Petifa didn't want to break Pyro. He just wanted to own him. He didn't want to break him. What did Yosef do with that experience? This is a place where they consider me nothing. And this is where Yosef tells his brothers, I was sent. What does that do? So now I'm going to go away from Yosef for a moment and apply it to people's lives and discuss an experience I have seen in certain individuals where an experience similar to Yosef could result in two different paths. Sometimes a person gets broken in life to the point that every last vestige of their ego is shattered. Especially because of things that happened during childhood, before they even developed a sense of confidence, or events that occurred 
later in life. And it's a point where the person cannot hold on to the identity that used to work for them. If my life is going pretty well, even though every life has challenges and problems, I can develop a certain identity and hold on to it and it works for me. It works on a daily basis. I'm getting through the day and night with not too many problems. I have an issue here, I have an issue there. Okay, eat a piece of cheesecake. You need a nice coffee, take a nice coffee. You need a vacation for a few days, it's getting cold, go to Miami. Well, too many people there go somewhere else. Go to Cancun. Too many people there too, I don't know. Find somewhere, go to Greece. But sometimes a person experiences things, maybe with themselves, with their children, with their marriage, with life's realities inside of us or outside of us, every person in their own life, where that old identity I was holding on to simply doesn't do it anymore. It's shattered, it's broken. So now, one of two things can happen. I can become a very broken person, angry, resentful, frustrated. And that's what really addiction is. Addiction is I'm numbing my pain through all types of destructive substances which will help me escape my misery. This is what easily could have happened to Yosef. And what happens if a person experiences what we're describing here as the feeling of I in the FS, I'm nothing, I'm worthless, I'm really nothing. And if a child experiences that, especially through certain types of abuse, physical, emotional, intimate, etc., that sense of self can be so shattered that this person grows up with an inner hole, a cavity, an emptiness in the core of the person where there's no I. So they are prisoners. Physically, I may be a free person, but my heart is in jail. My soul is in jail. My sense of dignity and self is completely in jail. It's incarcerated. I have no access to it. And I substitute it with a fake personality that could survive. But it's so, so painful and difficult and challenging that unless I really numb myself constantly and become detached and disassociated, I can't deal with it. And some people feel that they really can't deal with it anymore. The pain is too deep. Those who don't understand it are lucky that they don't understand it. Those who do, do. Life is so un, un, uh, so painful, so miserable, that the very living for a person, such a person could chas v'shalom be a curse, could be felt like a curse. It's here that Yosef goes through the most incredible transformation in the world. He experiences nothingness that liberates him. He experiences a sense of nothingness that sets him free. And I'll explain to you what I mean. Okay? I'll give a, you know, I'm going to give a very mundane, maybe not such a mundane, but I'm giving a simple example in my own work. As you know, I give a lot of classes and lectures. <laughs> I prepare for them. When I prepare a class or a lecture, what am I thinking about? Okay, there's three models, <laughs> three states of consciousness. And this is true, by the way, of any speech you'll ever give. It's true about any teacher, any educator, any speaker, and really any form of communication to your children, to your grandchildren, to your employees, to friends. It's, just, it's, a, it's about our relationship with others, whatever, that, whatever form it takes on. Sometimes I may be thinking about, about me, just me. It's my ego. I want to be successful. I want them to like me. I want them to invite me back. I want to brand myself. I want to make myself a name. I want to be affluent. I want to be a celebrity. I want to be famous. I want to do well. These are very human emotions that people have in many different areas of life, especially artists, whether it's actors or, 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 or business tycoons or, or singers or communicators or spiritual leaders. I want the people to like me. I want the validation from the people. That is one of the most stressful things in life. Because then, the pressure is so profound. Are they going to like me? Are they not going to like me? Is it going well? Is it not going well? Am I going to get a standing ovation? Am I even going to get an applause? Are people going to come and say, wow, it changed my life? Are going to say it was too long, it was boring, and they're going to be texting while I'm talking? I'm comparing myself to others. Afterwards, I'm self-conscious. What they think? What did they not think? How did they think? It's a miserable life. <laughs> it's miserable, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's something that can be after 25 years too. It's about the inner identity. <laughs> it could be after 20 years of motherhood too.
It gets worse, actually. It gets much worse. Because it's a bottomless pit. Why am I not there yet? The reason I'm not there yet is because because I'm, I'm feeding off something false. It's like filling up water in a cup that has a hole. You could fill it for 50 years. <laughs> I could get compliments for 60 years. As your grandmother would say, it's, it is, there's a hole in the cup. You understand? There's a hole in the cup. And then, then, then I would have to go to YouTube, how many views? But this person has more views. Oi, gewalt! Yeah, of course. Same is true with a principal. Same is true with every father and mother, every mechanic, every Rosh Hashiva, every Reb, every Mashpia, every, every relationship. I'm giving you an example of my work. There's another way. And, and here, there's also the pressure of comparing. And also, I, what if I fail? What if the class fails? Oi, <laughs> gewalt! Who's going to come back next week? And if it fails again? And what are they going to think? And they go, oh, the waste of time. I can't fail, I have to be perfect. But how can a class be perfect? So I can't, I have to not stop preparing. Why? Because it has to be more and more and more and more perfect. And if it's not perfect, Gewald, it's, it's, it's just, it's a miserable life. <laughs> it's so anxious, even though the person thinks they're doing it for themselves, they're actually destroying themselves. Now I'm gonna go, about the, I'm now gonna go to the other extreme. <laughs> which is the easiest way to live, but it's also the hardest way to live. And that's what Yosef experienced at that moment. And this is what this Yosef is also trying to grow into with God's grace and your patience. Yosef reaches a point where it's mamish, not about him. The real teacher, the real communicator is, this is not about me. Of course I have to prepare, and of course I have to present, and of course there's ways to present, and you need a structure, and if you have a good story, that's great. That's all wonderful, but what's, th what's at the core of it? At the core of it is when the person takes the ani and turns it into ayin. Ani is the letters of ayin. Ani means I, me. Ayin means nothingness. Why would I want to make my ani into ayin? Because there's two types of ayin. There's an ayin, nothing, you're a shmata, you're garnished. There's an ayin, that is not nothingness, it's no thingness. Nothingness, no hyphen, no thingness. You know why? The source of all things is iron. <laughs> you see, this tissue box can't be the source for the sun, <laughs> right? Because it's a tissue box. The only thing that can be a source for everything is what? Not somethingness, but no thingness. Hashem is not a thing, so it's the source of all things. It's the ultimate ayin. Ayin is the source of everything. It's the source of creativity because it's not stuck in any particular mold. What does it mean that ani becomes ayin? Ani becomes ayin means that ani liberates itself from being stuck in the orbit of the ego and says, I want to be a conduit for infinity. I just right now want to be a channel for the divine energy that's coming through me. So when I'm giving a class, I'm preparing a class, Who's really preparing the class? Hashem is preparing the class. He wants Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson to give the class. Okay, I'm here. He nanny. Fine, I'll give it. You want to use my brain? Use my brain. You want to use my heart? I made my brain. Tell me, I created 100 billion neurons in my brain. I'm asking you. <laughs> I created the 70 trillion cells in my body. <laughs> I'm speaking right now. The oxygen that I'm inhaling. I created this oxygen. I created my respiratory system. I created my digestive system. I created my circulatory system. You know what's happening in the body? 70 trillion cells working in perfect harmony, 100 billion neurons. And millions of aptic nerves in my eyes. So I could be able to see you. You could be able to see me. Every word come out as a miracle. I did any of this. And then I just said, oh, it's my, I'm giving the class. I'm my ego. What? The, the only, we, we delude ourselves and take control of things that make our lives miserable. Ayin means, I'm a shoifer, like we spoke a few weeks ago. What's a shoifer? A shoifer is, it's your, your voice, your sound. I'm going to be a shoifer. Now the hardest thing is to become a shoifer because I have to empty everything out. That we're, the hard work of this is not creating something, it's getting rid of. It's getting rid of the static of, they're going to like, they're not going to like. Well, how am I going to come out? Am I not going to come out? Brandy's having a good time today. Gewaldic. She knows what this feeling is like. She knows what this feeling is like very well. That's the source of joy. Because that means I'm in the moment. 
I'm teaching and I'm not here. I'm actually experiencing the moment in a good way I'm not here. How do you know your body is healthy when you don't feel it? <laughs> when you start feeling your body, it means something is wrong. If I'm feeling my pinky, there's a cut. If I'm feeling my head, there's a headache. Right? When your person works out or they're in physical, physical, fit and good shape afterwards, you feel light. I feel light. Why? When you're healthy, you should feel yourself. No. A healthy body means a body that is just a conduit for the soul. It doesn't feel itself. When there's chas v'shalom illness, there's an interruption between the neshama and the body, between the soul and the body. Now the body feels itself. I come into a room and I'm busy with self-consciousness. You think they like this class? You think it's going? <laughs> you think it's going well? It's not going well. They're going to buy it. <laughs> what about the other one? Oh my God! I'm everywhere besides here. I'm never ever present because I'm thinking about how to be present and why am I not present? And I'm guilty, and then I'm guilty for being guilty, and then I'm guilty for being guilty, but for being guilty, but not guilty enough doesn't stop this is the mental chatter of the ego that uses it uses all holy ideas but it's just going to it's just going to undermine the person It's also true in all relationships. Let's say somebody has a child who's struggling. Somebody has a child who's struggling. What's the worst thing to do? The worst thing is to do to connect to them from a place of my ego. You're disappointing me. You're frustrating me. You're embarrassing my family. What are people going to say about me? What's my aunt going to say about me? What's my mother going to say? My sister-in-law, my neighbors. What's it going to look like at the Sheva Brachas? At the Sheva Brachas, for heaven's sake, Tante Fega is coming. And she's going to see my granddaughter. Oh my God. You make a what's up for Tehillim just for that Sheva Brachas to be able to survive. I don't know Tante Fager. She's a wonderful person. Whoever. Huh? <laughs> I don't get involved in family politics. My point is, I don't know that that's always the answer. It's really inside work. It's inner work. It's inner work. Am I going to really be able to transcend that place? Now, I can't fully transcend that place. We have egos. <laughs> we, at least I have. I try to have. We vacillate between one place and another place. But the question is, which space do I want to live in? Where do I want to focus? What do I take seriously? What do I want to cultivate? What am I aspiring to? There's one in the middle. There's one in the middle. But I, I, wanted, to do, I wanted to do the two extremes. So I'm going to get to the third one in a moment. If I'm relating to that child from a much different place, and that is I'm full of gratitude for the fact that I can be here for this soul whom I love so much. That's what it's about. I'm full of gratitude for the fact that I could be here for this soul. I don't control souls. I didn't create this world. I don't know the story of every soul. I don't even know the whole story of my soul. I know the story of my child's soul. I have awe, reverence, respect, love, and I feel grateful that I was chosen for a mission to bring out the best in the song. I'm going to show up to the best of my ability. I'm going to show up with full presence, with full creativity. And then what happens is like back to that class. Your creativity could be unleashed. You know why? There's only one source of creativity. Creativity comes from the word creator, creative. People want to be creative at work, creative in school, creative in the house. How do you become creative? You know how? by plugging in to creativity, to the source of creativity. So you know what it's like? It's like I have a plug. And the plug says, you know, I don't like anymore being attached to that wall. I need independence. I'm done. Pull me out. And I pull out the plug and dead. <laughs> Computer is dead. The phone is dead. The AC is dead. The vacuum cleaner is dead. And the oven is dead. You know why? The electricity was coming through the plug. When you detach from the wall, you're not becoming free. You're detaching yourself from the source of electricity. You were a source of electricity. You were a channel for electricity. That's how you want to prepare. That's how I want to prepare a class. 
I want to plug in and be a source, a channel, not a source, a channel for the electricity. That's what it means. That's what bittel means. The word bittel doesn't mean self-destruction. It means plugging in the self to the source of self. So that my brain, my soul, my heart, my emotions, my presence, my instincts could become a channel for the creativity that needs to go through me. Does the class have to be perfect? No! I'm going to show up the way I could show up and whatever has to come through me today is going to come through me today. Nothing more, nothing less. Do I ever have to compare myself to somebody else? No! Every person's soul has its mission. There's no competitiveness. I can never take away your light. You can't take away my light. The wires are not competing for electricity. Why not? Nobody competes for sunlight. You're taking my sunlight unless you build a wall near my house. We're both in the park. Stop taking my sunlight. Shimsha kol It's God's light for everybody. We don't sit in the park. Stop it. And when we start building walls, that's a whole different experience. I start building walls to block and harness and manipulate and exploit the light. Now you're blocking my sunlight. Everyone has sunlight, and the sunlight is going to be channeled through your window, through my window, through your prism, through your channel. I can't take away. There's people, there's people, right, who love my classes. Some are even sitting here. There's people, I don't know how to say this, who don't. (laughs) They don't. It's too long. I use the word trauma too many times. Uh, Whatever. Good? Okay. It's to this, it's to that, I need this, I need whatever. One guy told me once, there's not enough muster, you have to be much harsher and sharper and negative and talk about punishments. Okay, fine. There's people who subscribe to my emails, people who every week unsubscribe. I could take it very per- Wow, they unsubscribe to me. Oh my God, what do they think about me? Oh, you get involved. Now I have to go to therapy because they unsubscribe to my email. Little did I know they unsubscribe because maybe they made a mistake. <laughs> That's what I tell myself. Or they unsubscribe because they're busy. But every soul needs to get influence from where it needs to get influence. Nobody can take away somebody else. I have my, you have your space, you have your light. It frees you up, it frees a person up. You, I show up the best way I can show up and I become a channel for the light, the electricity that's coming through today. Tomorrow, there'll be maybe different electricity that comes through. Gavald, and I have to show up. I got to show. I can't just sit in bed and say, I'm sleeping, God, you give the class. I mean, that would be easier. I stay in bed, God gives the class. But somehow Hashem wants us to be partners. He wants me to be the shofar. And then you also, I, you, you become much more creative. You know why? Because the brain is freed up. There's, a, there's an openness. It's not filled up with mumbo-jumbo self-consciousness looking for validation. It's actually free, like the brain is open. It's like the wire is actually clean. The shoifer is pure. So the you can actually tune in. You, there's no static. You can actually, your antennas can pick up whatever prophecy, whatever ruach hakaydish, whatever wisdom, I should say. I'm not a prophet or of ruach hakaydish, but whatever wisdom Hashem is channeling through your heart, through your brain. And this is true even in a in a date, in a meeting between a husband and a wife. It's showing up to be here in the present moment without without the need to protect myself, which comes from the need to survive. That's why it is hard. I told you I used the word trauma, so I'm going to use it. It's hard. I don't want to say something and not fulfill my promise. (laughs) Somebody who, who has active trauma, they're always in survival mode, and it's not their fault. And if I'm in survival mode, I can't let go. How can I let go? If I let go, you may stab me. I have to be able to have the real acceptance that God has my back, (laughs) that he's creating me at this very moment, and that I'm going to be safe to be able to let go and just show up. And I have to be able to go to those childlike parts that are innocent, and they're throwing in those thoughts. You're not enough creative. Your class is not good. Uh, this other person who's doing better, they're not going to like it. Uh, it's not deep enough. It's not intelligent enough. There's no structure. And all those thoughts that love to bully me or bully you I have to be able to turn them and say, I'm so sorry you had to develop these thoughts in order to survive. Maybe now you could let go. There's a lot of love and empathy there and compassion there. So therefore what happens here is the person frees themselves up because I'm becoming in touch with creativity. When Yosef had Tzaddik in prison, 
reorients his ayin, he's a prisoner. They want to turn him into ayin. So you know what he does? He uses the experience. He says, I'm going to be ayin. I don't exist anymore. But you know why I don't exist? Because only Hashem exists. Ein oid milvadai. Wow. That moment, all his dreams could start coming true. That moment, his greatness comes out. Because you know why it is? Because it's not anymore his own greatness that he has to protect. It's the greatness that Hashem chose him to be a channel for. Those were all his dreams. Now take a look. What happens at the end? At the end, they all come and get grain from him. They all get grain from him. When you plant a seed, what grows? Grain. (laughs) So that seed that was buried by his brothers, what did that seed produce? It produced infinite grain. It sustained the whole Egypt. It sustained the whole world. It sustained the whole family from that seed. But it had to go into the pit first. It sustained everything. And that's why we say in the famous Shir Hamalos, some people say before benching, you remember that famous Shir Hamalos? Meshu Hashem HaShiv So we say, Hazoyrim Bedima. Birina Yiktsoyru. Those who plant with tears will harvest with joy. Why do people plant with tears? Who's planting with tears? This is referring to a story. There was one person who planted with tears. Yosef HaTzadik was planted with his father's tears. His father didn't know. Yosef didn't know, but he was planted with tears. Birina Yiktsoyru, when it was harvested, there was joy. He was walking and weeping. As Noy says, they picked up Meshech Hazara, they pulled out the seed. But then when Yosef was carrying all the sheaves, there was tremendous joy. The family was healed. Everybody was alive. In Yosef's evolution itself, there's these two stages. Are you a servant or are you a prisoner? Because here there's two stages in this evolution. You asked what was that was number two and number three. Number one is ego. Number two is I'm a servant. I'm a servant. I work. I'm going to be successful. I'm going to be creative. I'm going to do the best. But I don't own my life. I don't own my life. I don't have to own the consequences. I don't own it. Hashem owns it. I want to be an Eved Hashem. What happens? Koyl asher oisa Hashem matzliach biyadai. An Evid has hands. Of course he has. You attribute it to his hands. You say, wow, the has golden hand. They belong to me. I'm the master. But you have golden hands. You can attribute it to the success, to the tichtikai, to the creativity of the servant. When Yosef was in the house of Paitifar, he was doing everything for Paitifar. But it could be attributed to his hands. biyadoi. Sometimes a person has amazing divine success, but you could say, you know what? There is consistency. This person is motivated. This person is ambitious. This person is brilliant. This person is, is candid. This person is upfront. This person is resourceful. This person has a schedule. This person is disciplined. You know how we do it. They wake up 4.30 in the morning. They're in the gym by 5. They're at the office by 7. They put inside. I would. They don't schlep. They don't this. They're on the phone. I got to talk. A schlepnisht. A hacknisht. He does. So how do you know it's Hashem? Because whatever this guy touches has atzlach of but it's biyadai. And that's why he's called Ish Matzliach. He's a man who's Matzliach. He's a man who's Matzliach. It attri- it's attributed to the Ish. This is very, very deep. But he's not ready yet. He's not ready yet. Because this is my yad, my hand. So the energy, the pure creative energy is still a little eclipsed. Because it still has to be channeled through my hands. In prison, Yosef goes through a second transformation because he was now in a second pit, a second bar. And in this transformation, the Torah says, and the words are, Vasher hu oisa Hashem matzliach, not even biyadai. There's not even a hand. You know why there's not a hand? Because his hand is actually the divine hand. It's not that Yosef didn't have a hand. It's not that Yosef didn't work in prison. It's the experience of being a nothing in prison that elevated him to a place of no thingness. So therefore, even his hand, he doesn't look at it like, I'm working for you. I want to be a channel. I want to be creative. Bless my hand's work. Yosef now reaches a place where there's nothing separate from the source. Nothing. Not even a hand that is a channel. Why? 
Not because he didn't have a hand, not because he wasn't resourceful, because now he actually becomes so one with the source that there's absolutely no separateness whatsoever. He's a breathing, walking embodiment of Ein Soif. He's a walking, breathing embodiment of Hashem's light, of Hashem's love, of Hashem's energy. It's not even attributed to Yad Doi. And that's why the success is of a different magnitude. It's of a magnitude where you don't have to say Koyla so whatever he does, you see it from everything. Not even everything. In the first case, you see it from the fact that it's everything because it could be attributed to his hand. At this point, Yosef transcends that. If I go back to that metaphor I gave, I can give a class taking me, me, me. I can give a class taking, okay, I'm an Eved Hashem. I work for Hashem, which is a very, very powerful, powerful development because when a person can go to that place, it, 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 uh, it emancipates, it emancipates a person, as I said, from that pressure, from that difficulty. So therefore, the energy can flow. Somebody could criticize, it's not the end of the world. Somebody could compliment, it, it, it's not the Yeshua of the world. The creativity is not stolen. And that is a very, very powerful experience and a tremendous development. That's Yosef's first development. And that happened only as he was an Evet, as he was a servant, because he rechanneled it as a divine experience. But still, I say, after a servant has to work. <laughs> I got to work hard. I got to prepare well. It has to go through my hand. It has to go through my brain. It has to go through my mouth. I have to prepare well. And you know what happens? It's still beautiful, but my ego, my, my, not my ego, my metzius, my identity, eclipses a little bit of the power of the energy. It eclipses the energy. And then there is where the person becomes the freest person. It's what we spoke a few weeks ago by Hikenagen Hamenagen. It's like the musical instrument. The musical instrument doesn't say, hey, I'm a nice violin. Are you like me? <laughs> the musical instrument is just a channel for the music. The notes of a song don't have any ego, not even as an Eved. They're just a channel. And this is where the person completely frees themselves up. It's a state of consciousness where the Ani is not felt because the whole Ani was transformed into Ayin. So now when the person is showing up, they're showing up with so much freedom because what happens now is, I don't have to impress anybody ever. You know how you know how you know how geschmack that is. I don't have to flatter anybody ever. You know how good that is. Man, <laughs> I'm working on it. I don't have to flatter anybody ever. I don't have to lie. I don't have to exaggerate. I don't have to dramatize. I don't have to deceive. I I can be authentic as authentic can be. Authentic doesn't mean you don't have seichel. Then it doesn't mean you say everything to everybody when it could be, we're not talking about being offensive or defensive. I'm talking about authenticity in the sense of showing up with full, full love, light, presence, including with pain, but showing up and not the need to ever manipulate and exploit it. It's going to go this way, it's going to go that way. I don't know how it's going to go, what's going to go. I'm just showing up right now to be a, sort, to be a channel for iron. Without any chishbainas. What happens at that moment in Yosef's life? You see the two butler, butler and baker are there. They're depressed. So Yosef says, why are you depressed? They say, we had a dream. He says, Hashem has the answer. And then he gives the answer. One second. You just said Hashem has the answer. Why are you giving the answer? Because there's kinship. There's oneness. Then Paro says, I have a dream. I need you to explain it. He says, I can't explain it. God explains it. So why are you giving an explanation, Yosef? <laughs> you tell them both that Hashem, and then you give the explanation. That's what Yosef is saying. Don't you get it? Yosef is saying, it's just Elikim. I'll be the mouthpiece for Elikim. I'll use my brain for Elikim. So now he could tell his brothers, at this moment, it was obvious. My life is painful. My life is not easy. There was a lot of tears in Yosef's life. Because that was part of the experience. The tears were part of the experience. It was painful. But in that very experience, this man was a transformed person. And therefore, the person in Yaakov's house goes through this evolution 
all the way to Hashem Matzliach, where there's no Yode anymore, and then he can become the king and, and, and run the superpower of the world, and it doesn't affect his faith and his spirituality and his authenticity, even in the smallest of ways. When that soldier threw the can of tuna, this was not something his Ani can precipitate or prepare for. The thing is, in other things, I think, oh, of course I could plan it and do it. The can of tuna, nobody can make that mistake. You're not getting it into a tunnel. And into a tunnel with Hamas terrorists waiting to kill you. That's obviously Yad Hashem Yosef. It's like a Hanukkah miracle. But the truth is, Yosef came to a place where he freed himself up from that. From that other form of pressure. And therefore, the light, the light uh, never fades. And I wanted to finish, and I'll finish with this one minute, because I know it's very, very late. <clears throat> I hope you're going to come back. Yeah. You're going to give me an applause. Yeah. Somebody's going to compliment me. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Next week, don't come back, because it's Hanukkah. We're not going to have a class. But the week after, you can come back. <clears throat> Yosef, from an Eved, he becomes a Shliach. An Eved means, I work for my master. That's big. I work for Hashem. By a shliach we say, Shluchoy shal adam kemoisei. Shliach means, I actually represent the one who sent me. To the point, a woman is allowed to send a shliach to receive the kiddushin for her, to receive the ring. Or a get. And she's married at that moment. That doesn't make sense. A man gives the ring and says, that woman is Mekudosh and she's married. Why? Because she made him a shliach or her a shliach. How does that work? The power of shlichus is, you're not working for me. Shluchai shel adam kemaisa. You're me. So Yosef says, "Lamichya shlochani elikim." I was sent kemaisa. If it's kemaisa, don't talk about my hand. I don't have a hand. It's your. Hand. <laughs> my hand is your hand. My brain is your brain. My soul is your soul. Wow, I'm free. It sounds like you don't exist. That's when you start existing. Ani oisius ayin. Ayin exists. You know why? Because it exists for real. It exists without the need to prove itself. It exists without the fear of disappointment. It exists without the fear of not having confidence. It exists with courage. It exists with full empowerment. It exists with for, full creativity. You're plugged in to the source of sources. If you go back to the beginning of the story, the first words is by Yaakov, Yaakov sent him. Yaakov didn't know, but what Yaakov was doing is he was turning his son into a shliach. A shliach of Hashem. That's why the first word of the story is Vayishlacheyu Me'emechevrin. The silence of Yosef is intentional as he goes through as he goes through this transformation, and of course this represents the whole miracle of Hanukkah, because the miracle of Hanukkah is what the oil wasn't depleted, <laughs> the oil burnt and burnt and burnt like the burning bush of Moshe Rabbeinu. Because basically the idea is burnout comes from the fact when I'm holding on to my limited energy. And when my limited energy is gone, I burn out. When the person tunes in to ayin, to the source of electricity, so of electricity doesn't have burnout. <laughs> the source of, of, of passion doesn't have burnout. I'm not burnt out. It's hard to tune into it because my ego doesn't want to let go. But when I can tune into that, you become a channel for a flame that never stops burning. Have a wonderful week, a beautiful Hanukkah, Lichtach Hanukkah, and we should see the light in the entire world and in Eretz Yisrael speedily in our days. Take it from me, Ad Mamash. Thank you. So absolutely resonates that all our parties are now Yosef HaTzadik, all of you. Yeah, 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 yeah. This was, this was never. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. The captivity, the captivity of Yosef. Yeah, the captivity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. From the Amek Hevron, from the depth of the abyss, the boy, he would rise to Hevron, which is Miloshan Chibur. Amek Hevron Chibur. And Bishchem is Baruch Shem Kvayd Malchusai. And Vayoymer Loihi Neni Loyus La Elam Vad. Vayoymer Loyus La Elam Vad. But the truth is, this is very apropos now, because when we have so many Jews in captivity, those who were in captivity, those who are in captivity, may Hashem bring them home safely. Really, Klal Yisrael is in captivity. Everybody's in a base Hasurim, because we're all connected. 
They are, of course, bearing the brunt of it. Rahman al-Islam, Hashem should protect them and liberate them. But this is a state that the Jewish people find themselves in. So we should see what we saw by Yosef. From prison to kingship. Amen. Yeah, of course. Yeah, what do you mean, the same model? Yeah. Yeah, I think we just have to realize one thing, and that is if I'm overtaken by fear or anxiety or self-loathing thoughts or all these types of dark thoughts, whatever they may be, so sometimes I try plugging in, but they won't stop. They attack and attack more and attack more. And then the Yitzhahara doesn't stop. So sometimes I could turn to them and say, you know, not now. <laughs> I need you to come up with another script. I need to remain in this space of, of, of oneness and safety and, and love. And sometimes it's very, very effective because we could tell our brains things. And if the brain knows its position, the brain trusts the soul. The soul can tell the brain things. But sometimes it's just very, very incessant. And a person needs to let go even on a deeper level. They have to like really, really let go because it's so powerful, it's so overwhelming. They have to like really let go of it so they can watch it, they can observe it, and then they can choose to say, you know, this is a part of me that needs a lot of healing, but I'm going to choose to be in my core soul, in my real ani, which is ayin. Sometimes that also doesn't help. So what I find is, at least sometimes, is that then we have to actually engage with those pieces. They're like little children, parts, and we have to really uh, engage with them. And, uh, and uh, they're, st they're feeling very anxious. They're afraid of something. So we have to reassure them. We have to, uh, like they do in IFS, we have to talk to them, we have to listen to them. Uh, we have to understand what they're carrying. Uh, I may have to tell that little child, I'm sorry that at three years old you had to take on this burden of bullying me 24 hours a day because you're afraid that I'm going to do the wrong thing. Or I'm sorry that you had to take on this burden of criticizing me 24-7 because you were afraid that I'm going to lose control and I'm going to get hurt. I'm afraid that you had to take on this burden of second-guessing myself and feeling guilty because that was your way of keeping me safe. I'm a big boy, I'm a big girl, and I could take, take it on and you could relax. And, if we know how to do this, sometimes we need help, um, it liberates them from those parts and they don't have to do it anymore. The ego, the Yetzirah, is a form of survival. It's like an animal, it's called an animal consciousness. It's, it's there to make, it, it's, 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 it's way of making us survive. And it does what it knows best. So it will make me very, very critical of myself, it will make me scared, it will make me anxious because it thinks that if I'm anxious, I'll be protected because if I'm anxious, I won't talk to the wrong person, I won't say the wrong thing, I won't go to the wrong place, I won't show up in the wrong way, so I'll be protected, huh? The doctor won't make the mistake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it keeps me in jail because wherever I am, I'm busy second-guessing myself, this is not good, this was horrible, and it's very, very hard. So we have to really not fall prey to it, not like let it take over, because it's a little child. It needs guidance. Sometimes we could say, listen, I got your back. I'll get back to you later. <laughs> right now, come back with another script. And that's fine. People who have that relationship with all their parts can do that. Tell their brain what to think now, and we'll deal with you later. Sometimes I have to really delve into it. Sometimes I just have to let go completely and surrender it all to God. But yeah, there's the different moments knowing of where we are. It's very important to have a support system to t be able to talk to somebody about it. It's also very important to be involved in other things that will give us fulfillment. Because if I stay in that place and I just wallow, the anxiety will increase. I have to be able to go into things that will give me fulfillment, that will show me other parts of my life. But altogether, it's, it's, it's an avoid. It's an avoid. And with every person, it works differently. And sometimes people can do it on their own. They need to be able to find that healing with other sources and other mm. other methods. Is this IFS thing or the yeah, so today there's a lot, a lot of different healing methods for trauma, you know. Some people, some people, you know, there's this trauma therapy, there's somatic therapy, uh, there's IFS, there's EMDR, there's plant medicines, there's uh, ex different exercises, there's meditations, there's mindfulness. Uh, there's, there's, there's a lot, the last few years, there's been a lot, a lot of... Uh, 
progress. I know some therapists, if you want to email me, I know some names. But there's been a lot of progress in different methods for healing trauma. But you just, people have to have a, a, good, a, good, a good person that, you know, gets it. Because if not, we could just go in circles. Yeah, Afrelech and Hanukkah, Afrelech and Hanukkah, everybody. I want to ask why? Why? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know that the answer to why, Echveis Vifel Irveist. In other words, I don't think that we could know why. I heard that here. <laughs> Something is making sense, like, make, and it's, it's the only thing that calmed me down. Right. Separated I'll tell you what I have learned is our focus on why is very normal, right? But I think. Like, during the entire show, I was like, yeah, but a seed needs to be planted. It needs to be, it needs water, it needs nourishment, it needs care. <laughs> And just kill the seed and let it grow. Right. But the seed sunlight is inside of it. In your case, the seed sunlight is inside of it and it's air and it's water and it's oxygen. It's inside of it. I guess I should have made it this way. <laughs> so if I focus on the question of why, it's a very normal question. But what happens is I can remain very stuck in the questions and I don't have answers to them we don't have how? answers huh and even how, like, yeah I know? think I think the focus is you know what am I doing today to be able to help my seed grow to what it needs to become and to be able to look at my pain as an invitation to go to a much much deeper and more authentic place right Right. Yeah. 